Right, okay. She is that to start with then. So how is everyone? Hope you've all been good in lockdown. I had a bit of a mad Tuesday actually where I thought I was losing it a bit. Um, such is life at the moment. More importantly, I have my tea. Welcome everyone. Frame rate looks okay. It is wobbling a little bit. Hopefully we should be good. So the plan is, I'll, I'll do the news and community stuff in a second. Um, and then um, what I'd like us to do, assuming our streaming stays up, is I was talking to Laurie earlier, uh, and I want to zoom back out on the PIO stuff. Um, and then maybe do a little work on... Um, a simulated piece that's a bit easier to see something than than we had last time with the uh, issues with the UART and the GTK and and talk around probably before that probably talk around um, what the purpose of the PIO is really in in principle and other possible uh, ways of getting to um, similar similar strategies for offloading processing on the IO side. Ah, oh, good evening Mythical Duck. May I call you Mythical? Um, welcome back again. Um, okay, right, let's do some news bits and bobs. Uh, um, Just talking to um, Laurie, I'm sure he'll join us shortly. Um, he's just working on a, a new version. And we, we were just discussing before um, I started streaming uh, on what we were going to cover on the PIO, what would be a good thing to cover. And that's kind of being written on the go. Um, so let's do the new stuff anyhow. So for those of you that may be watching this on... Um, YouTube. Um, this is basically this will basically be a recording of a live stream. It isn't yet, but it will be. Um, but where you can find me is um, if you ever want to watch the live stream is you can find me on Twitch, which is www.twitch.tv forward slash folknology. I normally stream on a Wednesday evening about eight eight p.m. Uh, GMT depending on it's summer or winter, obviously. Uh, if I don't make Wednesdays, then I normally defer to a Friday. Um, but I do normally note it either on the forum or on the um, schedule itself. That changes. Um, uh, in terms of the forum, so, so let me just post that URL so that you've got that. Guys, might help, right, Nick? Oh, I can't right click on that, that's annoying. Bear with me. Let's do it the old fashioned way. I'm also using my mouse pad 
which is making it a bit awkward because I don't even like this particular mouse pad on my laptop because as I mentioned earlier I'm trying to hook my Linux system up alongside my Windows laptop because I just got peed off using Windows again um, I'm not going to completely go back to um, Linux. So I'm going to keep Windows on the laptop because it's useful for testing and things. But um, yeah, I'm using Linux again more and more. And there's a bunch of things that I can't easily run on Windows right now. So I actually need to do that. And I want them on the same desk using the same monitor rather than having to move about the office constantly. Um, so I'm waiting for my KDM switch to arrive as well so I can switch my keyboard and mouse between the two devices. Um, so um, let me also give you the uh, Maestron forum address as well because that's a really helpful place um, to come find us to discuss and a third URL that's useful is the well, I have a Folknology community discord channel uh, so that's a good one as well um, I do use that and that's a good place to go before and after streams or in between streams as well if you want real time chat. It can be a bit noisy sometimes. Um, it's a very small number of people right now. Um, that may grow as if I keep posting it on, um, on these uh, streams and uh, YouTube videos. Um, just looking at my rate, keep switching between green and amber. Hopefully, we'll be okay for this. Um, so that's all the uh, that's the how you can get in touch with um, both myself and the community. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter as well. I should probably give you that. Um, you'll find me as uh, Folknology on Twitter, which is my common handle on the interwebs. So let's just, stuff I've picked on that's interesting to me this in the last few days. Um, uh, does everyone know what Glasgow is? Uh, I should probably give you the URL for that, actually. Because this one's relevant. Ew, that search wasn't helpful. <laughs> oh, it's funny. Glasgow City happens to be doing a crowdsource for funding uh, festivals. Not what I was trying to find. Um, Oh, that's strange. <sighs> Got it. So the Glasgow Interface Explorer. Let me give you the URL for that because uh, this 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 link is um, what I'm going to talk about just briefly is related to this. Anyone that was um, involved in funding this or has ordered it or has been watching the project. This is a project by uh, Peter or at Esden on Twitter. Um, and he's been doing it with a bunch of people uh, with, you know, number of well-known people in the FPGA community. 
the um, the board is based around an ice 42 let me just bring this up so we can see this as well you can see what I'm looking at just as a reminder um, browser let me bring that to the front hopefully pick this up so this is the puppy so this is the Glasgow interface Explorer so it's based around um, an ice 40 HX series FPGA if you ever saw the old bus pirate that was done by was it dangerous prototypes I think wasn't it this is like a modern day souped up version of that that's based around an FPGA. So it's great for um, interrogating uh, digital systems, uh, buses, protocols, etc. etc. Um, and it has the power of an FPGA, so it's a bit faster than the microcontroller in something like a bus pirate. Uh, it also has a uh, USB 2 high speed 480 megabits per second uh, USB interface um, and you can write little apps in Python um, using async IO um, with some boilerplate and then write your protocols in MIGEN for interfacing on the uh, two blue sets of pins there to whatever it is that you're hooking into whichever protocol that you want to look at capture etc um, so it's nice and easy to program to but the you can make little boards that plug into those blue sockets um, so for example I think has done Peter designed uh, like an EEPROM programmer that, that supports all kinds of old EEPROMs and stuff um, because it's got level shifters in the Glasgow you can actually output all sorts of different voltages including 5 volts um, so it's pretty smart so the, one of the things that I got, saw mentioned this week was a adapter board for this. Um, I mean, this isn't available yet, but the crowdsourcing has finished as far as I know. I don't know if you can still order one for after or not. They probably will be made available. So um, this particular board, daughter board looks interesting because what it is for doing is for actually analyzing USB not USB as in the actual low level protocol signals of things like USB 3 it's only for USB 2 uh, if you wanted to do USB 3 you would need to um, use something with high speed thirties because USB 3 uh, is in the uh, gigahertz region it uses differential thirties type um, communication protocols but for USB, USB 2 type peripherals and interfaces and if you want to look at things like um, uh, powered devices and the new PD standards of the USB then this is quite an interesting thing to look at so this is a little board that fits on those two blue connectors that will enable you to break into the signals of a USB-C connector and break into the USB 2 signals themselves so that's kind of cool so I'm looking forward to that there's going to be all sorts of stuff that we're going to see um, that's made for Glasgow because it's a very much a community based project so expect lots of contributions from different people so if you can think of a good idea to use that, then uh, make a little daughter board that goes on it. The way that the signals are arranged on the Glasgow is if you've got an upper 8 bits and a lower 8 bits, and the other pins to each of those connectors are just grounds. So you've got good signal quality. Because um, it, it can go over things like an IDC cable, for example, not just daughter boards. So for test leads and that kind of thing. So anyhow, I thought this looked very interesting. I've been looking at this, the USB-C stuff, quite a bit recently. 
Um, I've got a number of projects that I'm very interested in pursuing that will use the features on USB-C, or at least some of the features. And I've got some really wacky ideas for using USB-C even later down the line as a, a more advanced communication system. Um, that's going to be a bit more difficult. But I may do some basic USB and PD and USB-C stuff uh, in the shorter term. So this is interesting for me. Um, so basically what this does is uses the level shifters. So it can talk to the various pins on the USB connector. Um, so for example, you've got, um, as well as the USB uh, negative and USB positive USB 2 differential signal uh, there's actually two lots of that on the USB connector and this 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 board actually has those joined together because of the type of USB connector you've got it's a 16-bit and it joins them together um, you can separate them and I'll come back to that in a minute but the other signals you've got on there are things like the sideband signals as well as the VCOM and um, what's the other one there's one other signal on there sideburn signals and I can't remember what it's called now it's not sideburn it's called CA is it CA I forget um, and these enable the things like the mode to be um, signaled on the connection also which way around the USB C connector is connected which in most cases doesn't matter but in some cases it can for very special purposes and alternate modes um, but because there's all these very clever alternate modes um, you can actually use these sideband signals to do all sorts of different things such as UART and I squared C and I believe something like the um, the new uh, M1 based Mac support this so you can actually connect UARTs to these using the USB-C cable um, and there's all sorts of different configurations and alternate modes that you can use. Now this, this little board will give you an adapter that enables you to probe that and look at those different types of signal, but only in a limited way. You can actually go much further, but even so you could do quite a lot with this. Um, so that's going to be interesting, um, kind of as a USB protocol analyzer for USB 2 as well as getting into the USB 2 signal itself it's those actually USB C type things which are quite interesting and also dealing with things like the negotiation of power because on the new USB C type connections you could actually supply a lot more power up to about 100 watts but that means getting a V bus up to uh, 20 volts running it up to 5 amps but there is a negotiation that has to occur that enables you to step up your power from 5 volts, 500 milliamps, which is the older maximum standard for the USB up to the, these newer, you know, 100 watt type standards. Most of them are only 50 watt, by the way. Um, and I've certainly got some ideas on products around uh, that and using the USB-C as a way of bringing power in as well as using it to power other things out i.e. bi-directionally. Uh, so that's quite interesting. Bear me a set. I'm going to take my um, hoodie off because I'm a bit warm in here. It's a bit warmer today in the UK. The last two days have been very spring-like. It seems to have gotten over our snow and winter. We are still in lockdown, however. Um, as you may have gathered from my earlier comments. So that's the uh, USB add-on uh, debug oil. Um, what do they call it? Do they call it debugger on explorer no usb pd debugging um oh i keep trying to use that mouse and i can't the other thing related to this hector martin also known as markham on usb 
I'm a really smart guy that I follow. I follow many smart guys and girls, to be fair. So he's he's very knowledgeable about all this USB stuff. So I know this isn't really FPGA related, but it is USB related. Um, and he did a stream today, which I saw, which was very good. Um, Um, so he's got he's going in even deeper than the Glasgow can or at least at some level because there's a link guys um, he's building a debug board for USB power devices um, and he's He's probably being a bit more flexible with the signals. He's got a few more choices. It was really interesting to listen to his stream as he was going through and interacting with various people uh, about uh, how he could design this. And again, it's USB 2 primarily, and it passes through uh, the USB 3 from the host to the target. But it can intercept the target stuff. Um, so his aim here is to be able to go in and hack in with the UART and the I2C and all this other functionality that's available. So in this case, he's using an STM32. Uh, as you probably know, I, I tend to use quite a few of these devices. They're my fave go-to microcontrollers. Have been for some time. Um, so he's using that to decode and be able to control what's going on. So um, do listen if you're interested in USB-C and hacking it and being able to use these kind of alternate modes and use these UART modes and debug stuff, then uh, it's definitely worth um, checking out uh, what he's working on here. Uh, you can also get the YouTube. Signal. It's worth watching that as he goes through and he he ends up with this kind of this is just a um, uh, You know a block diagram at this point not a circuit diagram. He's his next dream He's going to go into KiCad and start designing this Which is kind of cool and he's very knowledgeable about this USB stuff, which is really good So there's a whole lot of stuff in there that I wasn't aware of um, in terms of what I think Apple and some other vendors are using and what some phone vendors are using these extra channels for on the USB, these side channels and things. But as you can see here on his diagram, he's able to do UARTs on any of the combinations of the side panel pins. And he's using both the D plus D minus pin sets because on a USB connector you've got two you've got one above the other normally you connect these together so that you can reverse the cable but in when you're using these alternate modes you can actually use those separately and have different things going on on those channels so by his combinations of using the side side band pair the D plus D minus A and D plus D minus B, he's got six different things that could be going on at any one time. So you could imagine, so you could have USB going, a UART going, and you could have, say, I squared C going, or maybe one of them is SWD, you know, debugging. Um, so it's just kind of interesting. So he's designing this board so he can hack around with them. Now, this isn't Glasgow. This is a dedicated board with a microcontroller uh, aimed at doing similar kinds of things, but so that you can go and, um, you know, start um, interfacing with uh, a USB-C target that supports these alternate modes and stuff. So it's very cool. Um, I also learned quite a lot about things. So I wasn't aware of this uh, FUSB 3202. I mean, I'd seen one, but I, I didn't know exactly what it did. So you get a bit of insight into that as well, which is quite interesting. It's also quite interesting when he was talking about what hubs he could use um, in this case, because he's effectively multiplexing all of these things. 
through a hub, as well as the USB for the STM32 as well, because that's got a built-in USB that she's using. And then he was also trying to work out a way that he could put uh, DFU on that USB bus as well, having a special mode control. Um, so again, it's quite quite an interesting project and quite useful to follow, particularly if you are working on the USB side of things. Um, again, we're not he's not going into the USB free side of things. That's much much more complex because then you have to use those differential pairs. But uh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, he's definitely worth following on um, Twitter as well. He's done all sorts of interesting things and will continue to do. So I thought I'd mention that one as well because it was related. Um, our friend FPGA Kian has been doing some more with his black ice and he's got DVI working uh, now. So I should show you that because it's kind of cool. And he's got this working on the ULX3 as well, by the way. It's not just the black ice MX. He tends to do things for both of these. Like he's bouncing blocks. How cool is that? Um, and the adapter he's using, strangely enough, um, is a P mod, but it's one that he got from Luke Wren. Now, if you remember in previous streams, I mentioned Luke Wren before. Luke Wren's working on the Raspberry Pi stuff, particularly on the PIO stuff, and doing DVI out of the PIO. And on his original board, he had P mods on that. So he did a little PMOD DVI HDMI type connector, not HDMI type connectors. Let's call it not HDMI. Um, and um, I think um, Kia managed to get one off Luke. Luke sent him one, which is kind of cool. So it made Kian's day because he finally managed to get DVI directly out from the black eyes, which he couldn't do easily before. So that's kind of cool. We like that. So that's all the news items I've got today. There is an update on um, uh, Laurie's site, and I'll cover that in a second. Um, any other news items for anyone else whilst we're here, whilst I sup some tea? What's everyone been up to? Anything interesting? <sighs> no, right, well, let's move on then. Uh, if there's nothing else anyone wants to bring up. So I know Laurie's been working on his PIO code. Um, he's been working on optimizing it. It was quite large to start with. Um, how big was it to start with? You, you could actually fit it in the MX, couldn't you, um, Laurie? The original one, but you couldn't do two lots. Oh, wait a minute. Mythical's got something. I was recently made aware of C64 VIC-2 replacement in FPGA by Randy Rossi. Do you have a link uh, for that, Mythical? Because there are quite a few people that love the retro stuff. I watch my stream, or oh, sorry, at least watch the videos. Let's have a look. Part 
We're P mods. Uh, who's this? Randy Rossi. I don't know Randy Rossi. What chips he got on there? Sixty four basic. Well, that looks cool. I'm going to um, mark that. And you've got the URL there, guys, if you want to look at it as well. I see he's got another video here as well. From seven months ago, homemade Vic 2. 65, 67, 65, 69. Video for the Commodore 64. Wow, that's a bundle of wires. Proper proto product. <laughs> yeah, there's a feature I plan to do if I ever got round to making a VIC 2 replacement, which was an editable color palette. Cool. Have you done any um, Vic 64 stuff, Laurie? Or any Commodore 64 emulation amongst your other stuff? I don't think. Is that one on your list, the Commodore 64? Wow. So he's running it on the on the original board. How cool is that? I don't know much about the internals of the 64 because I never had one. A friend of mine used to have one. So what FPGA is he using there? Can't see under amongst all of that.
Sorry, I'm just jumping. I want to see which FPGA is using. He's not specific about it. Looks like a cool project, anyhow. Cool. Right, anyhow, back to um, where we were. Spartan 6, oh, okay. So, yeah. Hi, this is an update on the system. If you haven't seen part one, does he talk about the Spartan here? Hmm, got buffering. I'm going to stop. Oh yeah, let's button six. Nice. Right, um, so yeah, sorry, back to um, the PIO uh, stuff. So um, it was quite big. So what, wait a minute, what is this? Um, Says the dis the Discord invite is invalid, mythical. Sorry, I didn't, I missed that. Maybe I didn't paste it right. Hold on. Let me just try that Discord again. The invite. If not, I'll generate another one. Just try this, um, mythical. Oh, I see. Mm. Just try this one again, um, mythical. See if that Discord link works. If not, I'll generate a new one. Um, so Laurie was saying, yeah, the first pass version of the PIO used 64% of the uh, ICE-40, which is the uh, HX-4K. That's actually an 8K underneath. But he's now got that down. And that was, um, is, that, is that with four state machines or just one state machine, Laurie? Oh, it's invalid or inspired. Right, hold on. Let me gen generate a new one because I want to be in a. Make sure. I didn't realise that those ran out. All right, hold on. Let me generate a new Discord invite. Bear with me. Uh, invite people. Uh, Try this one. Mythical. Hopefully this should work. Apologies. Um, so, yeah, with just one state machine, it was taking up 64% of the ICE-40, which is a lot. But of course, that wasn't probably wasn't using any block 
memory it was probably just using registers etc and the entire thing has not been optimized um, the um, uh, did that work oh yeah that did work thanks Mr. Cool. great cool um, I can see you on discord now as well so He's now Laurie's now got that down to 42% the one state machine. What does it go up to if you add another state machine, Laurie? I know it doesn't work, but have you seen what, how much that increases things? I'm curious. But yeah, it's still quite big. I'm sure there's a lot of optimization. I do remember um, I saw a I think it was either a stream or a video where three or four of the people that were involved at Raspberry Pi, including Luke Ran, were talking about the development. And I'm pretty sure they said that the PIO in the um, RP2040 um, transistor-wise only takes up a similar amount of space to one of the peripherals like the SPI peripheral. Now, clearly, we're nowhere near that. Um, unless, of course, their SPI peripheral has lots of registers and memory or something that we're not accounting for. Um, so there's probably still room for um, improvement, I would guess. I'm, I haven't looked through it all. We can have a look in a minute, in fact. Whilst this is happening, let me do a pull on that code base and then I'll have it ready of any luck. Uh, repo. Just stash any changes. And then do a pull. I don't know what changes I had in there. Let's do a pull. It is on the main master, I'm assuming. Let me just stop um, this complaining. But there's 31 commits in there since I last pulled. So significant, I'd say. Um, so I'll just catch up with the chat here. So Laurie Griffith says, four are in the Verilog, but three are unused, so netlist is not generated for them. Um, Two state machines now work, uh, and it nearly doubles the size. Wow. Um, this is now the PIO program. What well, you've made the main step of the, mo the program. So if um, let, let's do a recap then. Um, so we, we want to play around with the PIO again. I don't want to go too deep into the code and the code changes because there's probably loads there because I haven't looked at it for days. But um, if we go back to where we left off, towards the end of the last stream where we were covering the PIO stuff, we were looking at the test bench that had a UART uh, example. And I struggled quite a lot trying to get, trying to see what was going on um, in GTK, in the waveform viewer. Um, so one of the things I thought might be good is if we have something that's a bit more visually recognizable in terms of waveforms. Um, and the idea I had that I landed on Laurie today, given a few hours to play around with it, was um, 
basically um, have the PIOs operate, you know, the phases of the stepper motor. Uh, if you've been following the stream for a while, um, I did an Enmigen stepper motor driver for, at the time it was an alloy board, um, which was based on the ICE 5 up, up 5K uh, chip. And we were driving one of these low cost um, stepper motor, um, like a unipolar stepper motor um, motors. Uh, which is a five wire uh, stepper with gearing inside it's very small um, so given that we've done that and I can show you that in the Imogen version of that just to refresh in a second um, what does it take in order to do PIO version doing a similar thing in other words to abstract away the I diff difficult IO piece I say difficult the intensive IO parts of driving, manually driving uh, unipolar stepper motor. So um, I figure we'd have a attempt to play around with that because we'd be able to see that in simulation easy enough. So let me give you a reminder. Let's um, let's get rid of the browser for now. So what happens with um, Ah, did you did ah, turn the browser off? Let's get that turned off. So if I go, if we look at the original M Mygen uh, code, we don't need to understand it all. But the important thing is that the way that the stepper motors work is you're driving four coils, okay? And if you successively apply energy to the cores in turn, you can cause like a wave, a magnetic wave around um, around the coils of the device and move it forward. And depending on which order you provide those steps, those phases in, you can drive it in one direction or the other. Um, and normally you do that in either whole steps or half steps. If you've got like a proper stepper driver chip, uh, like those trinamic ones, they will do what's called micro stepping, whereby they simulate sinusoidal waveforms for driving these, and then they can micro step in between the step points uh, in order to get very, very smooth, accurate motion. Um, and steppers are really good because they're an open loop position control. You don't have to feed back where the position is. You know if you step once, you know where it is. So as, if you know where you started, you can know how many steps you've traveled, so where you end up. So normally, if you look at a device like a 3D printer, for example, you'll find there'll be an XY platform and then the Z for up and down, and then there'll be an extruder as well, which is probably stepper driven. So the state of all of these is controlled. So you have a homing set of micro switches, so you take it to you know one corner of the 2D square that's your point zero and then you can step anywhere in that sequence from knowing that homing position likewise with the z and you, you don't have a homing position actually for the um for the filament that you're pushing through the extruder but um basically every time you step away assuming the stepper motor has done what it's been asked uh, you should know exactly where it is uh, in other words, if it hasn't dropped any steps and you can be fairly sure it hasn't dropped any steps for two things. One, somebody isn't interfering with the device and two, you, the load on the motor is such that it's well within its limits. So it never stalls. Uh, the reason it will stall is normally because it's, it, it's ejected uh, plastics to the printed bed and it's got itself embedded in it. Kind of thing or somebody's actually interfering with the device so these because they're open loop controls you don't need servo type feedback mechanisms etc so they, they make it quite a good demo example now although we're not going to be dealing with stepping in micro steps what we can do quite easily because um, in order to do the micro stepping you need sinusoidal waveforms which means you need to measure the current through the uh, coils now there's two coils in the, or there's 
two directions of the coils. It's actually two coils, both a center tap for a unipolar uh, stepper motor. Um, so by energizing combinations of these in different directions, you can control the magnetic field around it. Uh, and that gives you a stepping. So there's normally four phases to that stepping, but you can also do a half step, which holds it in between the two steps. And we can go that far without having to produce any sinusoidal type waveforms and current controls. So if you look at the pattern, um, I can show you here. So if you look in the window, you will see I have eight phases. So the output is on the right hand side here. It's the second column marked A, B, C, T. So those signals go through to basically a buffer chip that ups the current and voltage to drive the actual stepper motor coils, of which there are four signals. So in order to make it revolve in say a clockwise direction, you go through this phase first, then that, then this, then that, then this, then that, da da da. So eight separate phases and then you start back at the beginning and you'd create a rotational action by doing this. If you wanted full step rather than half step, you'd take every second one of these values. But that would be more coarse because you're effectively moving it twice as far in each step. And this stepper motor it doesn't matter that much actually because it's geared as well. I can't remember what the gearing is now. It's probably like 48 or something quite high. So one in 48. But it's a good thing to be able to show because it's nice and easy um, to be able to do this. Now, if for every step you're making, you're having to present these phase patterns, if you imagine it's stepping at a relatively high speed, then if you are running this on a microcontroller, it's going to spend virtually all of its time actually dealing with outputting these different signals, um, which is a waste. It steals all those cycles away from the microcontroller itself for doing the more complicated things such as planning how many steps it's going to move or what the velocity should be and that kind of thing. That's where it should be focusing its power. So if you try and drive these directly without using a separate stepper driver chip and you do it manually um, using these these phases, even though you can use a simple lookup table like the one I've got illustrated in this uh, in this window here, um, it does steal a whole load of cycles and it spends most of its time dealing with this. So it's not a very good use of cycles. And you don't normally get this kind of peripheral built into most microcontrollers. There are times where you need to drive a lot of these. I have, I have projects where I've had to drive lots of these things. Say if you were building a, you know, a pick and place machine, so each one of those sheet feeders would need several separate motors in each. Maybe you've got 24 or 36 of those. So it's 36 times two. That's, you know, 60 or 70 stepper motors that you'd have to concurrently control. It's a lot of work. Uh, even if you had the IOs to do it, it would just steal all the process time you wouldn't do anything. So anything you can do in order to offload that task, the low level IO task, the better. Um, so that was why we had that n migen example that you see here. Uh, and simply all, all this does is it steps through those phases. Um, so here, what we do, I'll show you this. Um, so we're using a lookup table here. There's different ways of doing it. So this is a dictionary in Python. So we have the phase number as the key, phase zero through to phase eight or seven, sorry. And then the output for each phase. So all we do, if we want to rotate that, is we've just basically generated a case statement here. Um, This one, which outputs the current sequence number for the current sequence number, outputs the correct phase. Yeah. And then all we do is we count the sequence number for the phase either up if we're going in one direction or we decrement it down in the other direction. 
So it's a relatively simple piece of code for something like an FPGA to do. So I figured this would be a great thing for uh, the PIO to do. Not only that is it has a very distinct looking waveform. If you ever look at the pins, the IO pins. So unlike the UART, which is kind of difficult to see where the edges should be and stuff because you have no clock, um, something like a stepper could be more visually expressed. That was my thinking. So what would the PIO program look like? How would we do this on using PIO instructions? And can we run it on a simulator and debug it and see if we can get some sense coming out of it? So that's kind of where we are. Um, Laurie's come up with some initial uh, instructions that we're going to have a look at in a minute. So let me just catch up on the chat because Laurie has been talking to me during this blabbing part. I've been explaining where we are. Um, so there is now a PIO program, which I think I have. Uh, so let's get rid of that. Where did I put it? Is it this one? All right, what's the URL? Stepper ASM, right? So let me just put that on the screen so you can see it in the browser. It's that one. In fact, let me get it up on, let me get the Verilog and stuff up and I should be able to see it directly rather than using the browser. So let me change PyCharm to this one. And I should imagine we can see it. Uh, is there a separate ASM folder? in the sim folder I'm guessing um, step R V and the ASM is I can't really see the ASM Oh, is a separate ASM I'm being in the directory. So uh, the instruction sequence that we have is this. So what's uh, Laurie saying? Um, run the simulation. Yeah, I'll do that in a sec. The stepper phases are wrong. We'll need debugging. That's good. Gives us something to do. This is the line that sets the phases. And have a look in a sec. Bits are shifted out left. Assembler program in the ASM folder. So these are the instructions here. So, um, so we're storing what's in the OSR the output shift register. Sorry, we're storing what's in the moving from what's in the ISR to the OSR. Is it that way round? The move source destination. Um, the set x eight. So we're using the scratch register because we need eight phases. Um, so yeah, currently the, the phases we have are stored in the, don't forget, we're kind of reusing some registers here because this was a, from a conversation we had earlier. So you've only got two, um, two registers, 
scratch registers X and Y. But what you can do, if we're not doing any inputting, we don't need the input shift register. So we can use that as a storage. So we can store our phase table, if you like, in the ISR. Now, um, remember that the phases are actually eight lots of four digits. Now, if you put those together next to each other uh, in order, you've got a basically a 32-bit uh, word that you can store in a single 32-bit register. Now, we happen to have one. I mean, we could put it in Y, by the way, but we might want to use Y to count the number of steps. But um, for a simple example here, what we're doing is we can put that in the ISR. We can write that directly in the ISR from the program. And then we can put that into the output shift register. And we can then set X to 8. And then we can count down. So after 8 cycles, so we're going to decrement X 8 times. So when it's zero, it jumps back to loop, okay? And then it's gonna output the four pins, the values from the shift register in four pins. So what we're doing is we've got an eight bit value in the output shift register, and we're shifting it by four bits at a time. And those four bits that are being shoved off the end, if you like, uh, although um, Laurie's saying left shift, not right shift, whatever. Um, those four bits that come off go straight to the IOs. They are mucked straight towards four IOs. So we're taking four IOs with each shift. And we're doing that eight times to get the sequence. So it's actually a really, really very simple um, set of instructions to do this. And presumably we just have that set as wrap. Well, in fact, we don't need wrap, do we? Okay, let me just check what uh, Lai's saying here. Uh, bits are shifted out left, yeah. Assembler programs are in the ASM folder, yeah, I found that. Um, and yes, it's going from ISR to the OSR. Uh, the ISR is set to the phase by an immediate execution. Okay, so from within the core program, we can actually write to the ISR register to set up those phases initially. So we're really just using the ISR as a setup value. And then we're on each cycle, we're copying that round. Oh, when we initialize, we copy it into the output source register. Um, so does it wrap and repeat? So it goes back. So it loops eight times. See, and then it wraps back to move OSR ISR. Is that right? So it kind of does this once, sets that to eight, then it does this loop eight times, and then it goes back to that move from ISR OSR to refresh and start it all again. Real. So all that will do is it will move through those eight phases. So what you'd see if this was driving the stepper motor is you'd see it rotating in a certain direction. I think it'd probably be backwards in this case, um, depending how you wired the or four pins, of course. If you've got them any other way, then uh, and it will go forwards. So what we should do is have a look and see what's going on underneath. So what we can do is we can actually run this. Um, so what do I need to run? You've already told me this. In fact, we could have a before we do that, let's have a quick look at the uh, stepper in the sim to look at what we're going to be um, running in the simulation. Is it stepper.v, did you say? Yeah. So a lot of this is similar to what it was before in the other simulations. Always begin uh, after 20. I'm saying uh, make sim tb equal stepper. Yeah, I can do that. I can run this last time. Nothing to be done for sim. 
Am I in the right directory or do I need to CD into SIM? Ah, oh, make clean. Oh, because it made last time, probably. Still says, make nothing to be done for SIM. Do I need to be in the SIM directory then, or not? Clearly not. CD SIM, yeah. Main bad. PCD dump info, open for output warning, step over. Not enough words in the file for the requested range, not 31. Does that, that matter, that error? It didn't have enough things to do. Anyhow, so just looking at what it does. So it loads in the stepper mem program. Yeah, which is the uh, presumably just the instructions for that assembly, right? The warnings are OK. Yeah. Um, program length is four, as in four instructions. To remind ourselves. Yeah. Um, Clock divider, that doesn't matter for our simulation. Pin groups, yeah, exec, exec control, that's wrap top, okay. Um, can't see output on screen. What, you mean GTK? That's because I haven't run it yet, if that's what you're saying. Okay, so what I need to do next is get my, I have to run PowerShell first anyhow to um, get it up because that's the way it's configured my GTK and I need to do, is it Waves VCD that was the output or is it SimWaves VCD? Uh, source machine, source. Uh, waves.vcd so I should just be open this with any luck to see let me get that up for you guys so that you can see it as well maybe get it a bit bigger if we can Uh, what do I want? Machine one, don't I? Now, what signals do I need to look at? Uh, pin naught to four, yes, but I, I need the clock as well, don't I? Uh, so let's put the clock over. Um, we're not sending any data at this point, so we don't need to see the FIFOs. We might want to look at the OSR. Yeah. And what's the trigger for the OSR? Is it um, is it the out signal or is it the set? Wait a minute, what do we use for the trigger? <laughs> out shift jump in instruction in shift. Um, okay, let me just get the. I just wondered if there was something we could look at to see the shift uh, status. Is there? A, do we need to look at shift count as well? Oh, mythical's got to go. Okay, see a mythical. Thanks for dropping by. Um, Laurie, do we need to look at uh, shift count? Do shift out, that's it, thank you. I knew there was something um, to tell us when it got pushed out. 
Why can't I see do shift out? Is that not part of machine one? So the do I need wires PC four colon zero, did you say? Or pins? I really wish the font was a bit bigger on here. Pin not frame. I have the wrong file again. Oh. Is it the one in the Sims directory? Is that what I'm doing wrong here? Do, 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 do. Yeah, it's by default it opens that older one, I think. Hold on, I've lost my bloody shell now. Uh, so it's under the Sims directory, isn't it? That's probably what I've got wrong here. Or Sim, not Sims. PGIO SIM waves. PGA underscore PIO forward slash SIM. Right, okay, I've got a source in here, idiot. That's why I can't see it. It's let us try once more. Oh, I do hate this touchpad. Very difficult to pick the bloody corners up. Right, let's look again. Machine one, we want PIO. Hold on, no, I don't want the whole thing. Come on, open up the PIO. Machine zero, right? So, clock divide. So let's do um, Machine, I've got so the output is is it clock? Yeah, I guess it is. So it's append the clock in there, and let's add the um, 
do out shift and then we need to add the shift value OSR shift value we don't really need direction at this point and then we need pins one two or zero through two three let's do those for the moment and then what is it zoom to um where is it zoom is there a button for the uh zoom to window that one okay yeah this looks good sort of so there's our clock uh there's our do out shift here's our initial value i wonder if we can show that what is that in is that in hex So that's after it's shifted. So there's the pause. Um, that's when we do the move. Is this, yeah, I don't, we can see it anyhow. We don't need to do this. So this looks kind of right. But maybe we're just starting a cycle too late. Sorry, possibly. We're chopping off um, in shift has phases. Yeah. Um, let's have a zoom in. Yeah, we can see it better there. Is that readable? It's very small on the screen. Laurie, let me know. Um, so you can see zero zero C four zero. Four six zero zero six two zero zero twenty three zero zero thirty one zero zero plus for a minute. If I shift in a bit more, I want to see what these actually are. See what we're getting here is, I think no, that may well be. Hmm. It's pretty close. If we didn't have the pause, it will probably be spot on. I think, um, Laurie. The pause is breaking up this point here, so the output isn't doing anything at this point. What we probably want it to do is hold the output. It's resetting the output, isn't it? And we'd really want it to stay in its last position. I think then that will become part of this waveform but this will be elongated this state will be elongated but we've got zeroing going on here as it goes back round the instructions um, let's just switch back And I think, uh -huh. switch back to the test bench. Just move this out of the way. So. Um, 
97 this one this is the uh, phases yeah I think those are right let me just um, check uh, so let me just copy this Right, you can go through, sweet. You can go through. I am, but you can go through. Uh, hold on. Uh, copy. So that's what my phases look like. Let's just see, let me just um, comment those out. So, uh, one zero zero zero, one one zero zero, zero one is a hundred, zero one one zero, zero zero one zero. Zero zero one one. Zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero. Those look the same. Those are exactly the ones that I sent you earlier. Uh, the only issue might be. Oh, let me just double check. I didn't change these. These will probably be the same. Let me just copy just in case. Make sure that these are identical. I've got two versions of the old NMIGEN program. Or um, Verilog, should I say? Um, Python. Those are the same. So I think those phases are correct here. Sorry. Those look good to me. But you're feeding them and you're feeding them left, aren't you? MSB first, could you say? So one zero zero. And ending on one zero zero one. So if I look at the state, that's one zero zero one one zero zero. It looks looks correct to me. Laurie, that looks correct to me. It looks like it's doing everything in the right order. We're going from three to zero. Well, it's going from this one down to this one, right? I mean, it doesn't matter which order you do it in. It's, that just changes the rotation. But there's a gap in between the two, which makes the waveform look weird on GTK because there's a couple of cycles. And what we really should have it doing, I think, at that point is just holding its state. Or if we can eliminate those cycles, even better. Um, so just putting the, let's put the waveform back on. Sorry, mate. Bit of fiddling around here. Yeah. 
so yeah you've got this area here before it kicks in again which makes it look weird because you've normally this would be continuous if you were going round right so that would join up with this so the the length of this would be the same as the other pieces it's because of where we're starting that it looks weird and the fact that we have you know a couple of clock cycles before it reloads i mean what it should do is it should hold its last state rather than resetting the gpio output pins So what will we need to change instruction wise for that? Um, so let's go back to the instructions and remind ourselves what we've got here. So these are the instructions. So this takes a cycle, presumably, the move, as does the set X8. There's an out sticky, oh, out sticky option. Is that what they call it? So in other words, it keeps its last state, if not. Is it because it's wrapping, it resets the outputs? Um. Six, eight. You, you can't make the shift register reload it, re. Insert its um, MSBs into its LSBs. You can't do that, can you? Is there a mode for doing that? To save you having to refresh the phase each time. But I mean, for when we have, I mean, that's just simply going round and round. That's not controlling the number of steps. But when we control the number of steps what you don't want to happen is the output values to um, drop because whenever you do that with a stepper motor you lose its position because it's no longer being held in that magnetic field place and as soon as you drop it it will move to one or other of the nearest states given that it's half stepping it's halfway between two states and it will fall to one or the other of those um, full steps so you'd actually lose half a step position plus or minus so you have to keep them energized um, not to lose position which is why the phase state is input important to um, keep a hold of not only for the internal state condition of the uh, state machine but actually for the stepper motor to hold its state effectively so your ios need to hold that state um, so it's losing clock cycles here. So what causes the outputs to be reset? Is it the fact that you've imp that, that it's wrapped that it always resets? Is that the default behavior? Because we haven't actually set the out pins at this point. Oh, it's because the shift register is now zero, isn't it? So it doesn't have a shift and it's only got zeros left in the shift register, right? So it actually does the extra shift, which is just zeros. 
which pulls all the lines down. Is that what, what's happening? It's doing an extra shift with zeros in. Let's just go back to the um, Go back to the GTK. Uh, would we be able to see that? Um, Yeah, well, you can see it. I'll tell you where you can see it is if you look here, Laurie, is there any way of highlighting? Yeah. So if you look here, the shift register is zero when it when we see this do out shift at this point. Or is it at that edge? I can't remember. So it's doing one too many shifts, basically. Hold on. So it starts off that value, then it does a shift here. Um, so the IO doesn't changes one clock cycle later, is that right? I'm trying to imagine what's going on here because it's not set at these points. The first point it's set is here. So this point corresponds to that value. So this point will correspond to the zero value. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Yeah, you've effectively got 9. So we can change that, can't we? So if we set x to 7, Let's just try changing that. Hold on. Um, let me get back to the point charm. So what we want to do then is change that to seven, right? Um, save. How do you turn your ASM into? Is that done dynamically, or do you run something on it? To get the uh, values, you need to compile it by Uh, what does the stepper read? Where does it read the program? Which file? Stepper.mem. Stepper.mem. If I look at that manually, uh, is it the second command where it has eight there? If I change that to seven, would that work? <laughs> manually hacking the microcode. I can't remember all of the bit fields, the operands, widths and stuff, but I can see an eight there. 
compile. Well, I type compile. Is that in the sim directory? Compile with a dot slash on both. Uh, stepper the ASM, right? Oh, I see what you mean. Dot slash. Uh, why can't I see? Why isn't there a? St oh, it's in the ASM folder. Because don't forget, I'm in the um. ASM. And I want to output that to stepper.mem. Where does that go? That goes in this direction, stepper.mem, like that. Compile not found. Oh, make compile, is it? Where am I getting the compile from? Dot slash compile. Sorry, yeah. Is in is that in the top level directory then? Where is the compile? Ls. It's not there. Ls. Dot slash. No. ASM directory. Okay, thank you. So now this value should have updated then. Yeah, and it has just changed it to seven. <laughs> Could have just hacked it. So if I now run my test bench, Again, make sim TV stepper, right? And if we go back to uh, GTK Wave and reload the data, hold on, let me get this up for you guys so you can see what's going on here. Reload waveform. Yay! See, that looks better now. I mean, it has stretched that first stage longer because there's still two cycles where it's not um, not shifting, where it's going and doing the uh, move, copying the... Um, uh, stepper phases from the ISR to the OSR and then setting um, the uh, uh, limp, uh, sorry, the loop control counter to seven. But that looks healthier now, doesn't it? What do you think, Laurie? I'm low on liquid. How are we doing for time as well?
coming up to the two hour mark. Might be able to fix that with delays. Bless me, sorry guys. Hope I didn't just blow your eardrums. Um, fix that with delays. I'm just thinking where this would normally sit is you'd be, what would you be doing? Your outer loop would effectively be the number of steps, right? And that outer loop would be jumping to this inner loop. Uh, so you could use the Y. Could you use the Y register to hold the number of steps? Maybe to how many times it ran. Uh, the phase change so it wouldn't just be going round it would um it would be calling it however many times what you'd have to make sure is that you come back to the beginning of course so um but basically i think that does it so that's really cool um there's a big delay at the start Oh no, it's because I've moved it. There we go. See it better there. Yeah, you can see that elongation in there. So we're losing a couple of clock cycles. So if we wanted to move a certain number of steps, if we assume that that was in the Y scratch, we would then call those instructions that many times. But it would always have to go back round and start back where it was. Um, it's almost like you want an 8-bit register that went round. Like an 8-bit counter. Um, Yes, the delay at the start is configuration. But the shift process itself is destructive. Is there any way to make the shift process non-destructive? You know, when we shift out four bits, um, Laurie, it shifts in. So we're shifting out from the left, right? And then it's shifting in four zeros into the right. Can we not feed the shift output back into the LSB? So rather than it feeding in, um, rather than it feeding in zeros, it feeds in the output to the last four bits it shift. Is that possible? Is there a shift out mode that does that basically what you're talking about there is rather than a shift it's it's actually a rotate function um, I'm trying to remember actually if uh, on the XMOS the IO registers did that they might have just had an auto reload Yeah, Laurie has said, <laughs> we can, of course, do our own version of PIO. Yes, we can, but no, we can't. <laughs> um, I'll come back to that in a minute. Maybe we can cover that now rather than trying to solve this problem. But um, the reason we can't is because we need it to be compatible. If you're going to step, you know, if you're going to go off piste, then you can do much simpler things anyhow. You just need a rotation register. You don't need all the other instructions. <laughs> you just need a counter and, and um, 
Well, you've seen the HDR that we created for the stepper motor. It's very small. Um, I'm just wondering what tricks the PIO instructions have. Because I seem to remember in the document, uh, Raspberry Pi SDK and PIOs. No mere sec, folks. Just trying to remember. No, that's the wrong one. Damn it. Data sheet. Right, uh, let me just show what I'm looking at here. So if you look at the data sheet, It seems to indicate that it can take out of one side and put it back in the other side via the MUX. But the label here says unused out data. Does that mean that you can either send it out or you can send it back to the shifter, but you can't do both to do this kind of, or maybe I'm misunderstanding this diagram. Because that, looking at the diagram, it looks like you can feed the output back into the shifter, Laurie. But maybe it's a case of you either send it out or you send it to the shifter, but you can't do both at once. The OSR fills with zeros as data is shifted out. Because if you look at that diagram, that suggests that um, that isn't the case. I wonder if the diagram's just wrong. I mean, what is unused out data? Wait a minute, look, what does it say here? The state machine will automatically refill the OSR from the FIFO on an out instruction. No, that's different. It's not what we're thinking. Because we're trying to avoid using the FIFO, because we need to use the FIFO for um, stepping information, right? stepping data oops 
over zoom I think my machine's having a bit of a problem coping. I might have too much running. Yeah. That's really weird that it's got that unused data out because I don't see any reference to that at all. Maybe it's, um, are there any parts of the op opcode for shifting that aren't used? <laughs> Or aren't explained. Maybe, maybe there is a thing for doing that. The extent can ultimately refill the OSR from the FIFO on an out instruction once some total shift count threshold is reached. Auto pull. Yeah, I mean you can automatically get it to pull from the FIFO, but not from another register, unfortunately. And you don't want it in the FIFO because that means that the core would have to constantly put the phases into the FIFO as well as all the movement instructions, which would seem daft. Those phases should be inside the state machine. They shouldn't be having to be supplied through the FIFO. Yeah, the input shift register can do some stuff, but not the output register, even though it's got that line there that it calls unused out data, which in itself is a very interesting concept. What the hell is unused out data? Mm, maybe there's a secret mode. Because it definitely says here, look, the OSR fills with zeros as data is shifted out, even though that diagram suggests something else. Okay, um, so we can't cheat that way, which is a shame. Um, so we have to do a reload, in this case from an ISR. Um, and there's nothing we can do on the scratch regist register to have that automatically reload either with the value 7. So we have to set that to 7. So we're always going to lose those two clock cycles. So the fastest it could shift is it could do 8. Sorry, fastest it could step will be at the clock rate plus. So a step every clock cycle plus. Uh, two clock cycles every eight steps. I mean, that's not a huge problem. Well, I say it's not a huge problem. The issue is um, if you want to control the velocity of the motor and you need a constant velocity, having those extra two clock cycles come in every eight steps is going to mess with your velocity control. Um, so you'd have to assume 10 clock cycles for every eight steps. I mean, if you were doing more than eight steps each time, it's probably less of an issue, but is there any other way of doing it? Are we thinking about this wrong? How do we get it to recycle those phases? I mean, we don't need to worry so much about the set eight, set seven, because we don't know how many steps we're going to move. The outer loop is going to control how many steps we're moving, depending on how many steps we're sent. But the inner loop will still have to wait one clock cycle so it can reload from ISR to OSR. 
because there's no way of using an internal recycling method that we can see, despite what the diagram shows us in the output shift register. But losing one clock cycle is better than losing many. So in other words, the steps could be broken up into any number of chunks, um, but it takes us nine cycles to do eight, eight steps. So there's always one hold step, whatever happens every eight cycles. So that's a bit odd, I guess, more than anything. Oh, cake. <laughs> um, hmm. Okay, well, we can have a think about that. There's no obvious answer to that. Maybe some cleverness. <laughs> Um, hmm. you could unroll the loop and put delays on every out apart from the last What you mean use eight output instructions in series? I mean, yes, you could, but then you're going to use your instruction memory. And I was hoping to use some of the other state machines to drive, say, another motor. So it didn't, so you, that you didn't end up. I was assuming here that you could use two state machines to drive a single motor. Um, if you start using eight instructions, Well, you've got four state machines, so you've got 32 instructions. That might not be too much of an overhead. It seems daft, though, doesn't it, to have to do it that way? So then you wouldn't be using Scratch X. Well, what would you be using? Where would you get the constants from? Because you can't store that many constants. Well, I see what you're saying. So do it at half clock speed, effectively. One every two cycles. Mm. And that's quite possible because the step rate is going to be relatively low speed compared to the clock rate. I know we're doing it in a sim here, so we're doing it at whatever the clock rate is. But in reality, the step rate is relatively low for most motors because they are mechanical in nature so they can't move that fast so it's not like we're desperate to make it happen every really fast clock cycle we've got plenty of clock cycles if we want to do it that way so what you're saying is run a faster clock and then increment phase every two clocks or whatever yeah that would work that's a quite a good way however you need more instructions i guess Um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? You forget how fast this thing's capable of running versus the stepping, but it does make it look a bit awkward, I guess. But yeah, you want to. For constant velocity control, you probably want to do something like that. Hmm. I mean, this is fairly unusual case for the PIO point of view. A lot of the time, what's controlled, what's being controlled in the output shift register is coming in through the FIFO. It's not a set of constant uh, patterns as we're using here. So the problem, the nature of the problems um, a tad different in that sense. Hmm. Yeah, and 
the other the other point I was going to make, just to go slightly off piece, is that you know if even using one state machine, you're using forty two percent of the resources in black eyes. Think of the size of that compared to you know what the simple n margin uh, creates. You know, which just uses a handful of lookup tables effectively. Plus, you know, the lookup table. Sorry, plus the phase table. Uh, there's just no comparison. Um, so I should really switch back to one of the things that I wanted to just re emphasize about this entire thing. You know, the reason that Raspberry pi have put these pios in place is to is to enable you to take your real time or fast stuff out of the cores stealing cycles and have it run automatically on uh, on these state machines it's a really good way of doing real time and that's all we're doing with the fpgas in many cases we're offloading the you know the very time consuming not time consuming the cycle stealing io cycles and having those automated um by something other than your core so your cores can actually concentrate on doing the thing that those instructions are good at um and this becomes a real problem you see when you know the von neumann architecture is really good for when it comes to processing but it's really crap when it comes to dealing with real time and then someone had this you know uh i don't know who had the idea actually i, I should really check in the history uh who decided to put interrupts into the architecture to deal with real time stuff um and interrupts always have struck me as a bit of a plaster on uh on the core that von neumann architectures just weren't designed to do this stuff and slapping interrupts on the side was always a big compromise um, if you're doing something simple like you've got one real-time event that you must deal with then interrupts are great but when you've got multiple real-time events happening in the real world you you're effectively dealing with things that happen asynchronously in the real world compared to your synchronous inner uh, clock cycle and your instruction uh, operations uh, and when you've got one of those happening it's not too bad you can kind of predict what's going to happen when you're being interrupted but when you have multiple real-time events and that's what it's like in the real world certainly you know a lot of the work i do is in automation and robotics and stuff you have tens of different things going on uh, and interrupts just don't cut it because it becomes impossible to predict how the system is going to perform when you have interrupts interrupting interrupts and you get all these incalculable uh, delays caused by different combinations of interrupts occurring either interrupting the interrupts and finish, preventing them from finishing or if you don't allow that then you get these long latencies before the interrupts can be serviced while it's finishing the other interrupts so um, it's not a good way of dealing with real world scenarios which is why things like the xmos uh, microcontrollers were really good because they didn't even though they had did support interrupts um, what they allowed for is a 10 nanosecond io resolution that would switch um, that literally switches control um, based on an IO so you've effectively got like a select statement you can imagine it as a hardware switch slash case statement where it switches its focus on to doing something else and of course in XMOS it's not one thread doing that you have multiple threads servicing all of the different IO events switching between them um, which you can make a lot more sense of and when you're writing the stuff it's so much easier to deal with than having to deal with this um, kind of Neanderthal type interrupt stuff so being able to 
design your hardware, either by using PIOs, for example, to offset some of those real-time tasks, um, or to design hardware inside an FPGA that handles those for them and takes them away from the cores, um, and turning those into things that bubble up event data that can then be processed asynchronously uh, when the cores aren't as busy um, is, is a real bonus because it makes the whole process of designing things that interact with the real world much more easy. Um, you know, in a PIO sense, uh, that effectively takes quite a bit more in terms of resource. So if you look at this stepper example, um, the number of resources required to implement that stepping, that phase stepping is actually very small in terms of the number of lookup tables you might need to do it in an FPGA. Um, whereas the number of lookup tables and memory blocks that you'd need to create a PIO in the first place to run inside an FPGA would be very large. As Laurie says, just one state machine uses about 42% of the resources in terms of lookup tables, not, not memory. Whereas if you did, you know, the logic just for a step controller, it would just be quite literally a handful, plus a little bit of memory of uh, lookup tables. So with the FPGA, you can be much more effective um, in some of these particular tasks um when you're designing the hardware so even though pio is a way to go and it's a great way to go if you've got fixed hardware you're effectively doing it in a very small subset of instructions in software then you know in that microcontroller sense it's good but if you're working in an fpga environment where you can design your own hardware for that specific task that's always going to be more efficient that was my point. So the idea of taking the PIO and just tweaking it so it could do that. Um, well, you may as well design a stepper in HTL, right? Not bother with the PIOs because you're just creating a very inefficient structure for doing the same thing when you've already got the option to design the logic just for doing that task. Um, and this is something that I do want to focus on as well moving forward, because the question is, how do you design the logic for dealing with those real time tasks? How do you program that? How do you make it more like programming and less like hardware in many cases? You're always going to need some hardware bits, but if you could express it using software in a more efficient way, that's that's a great way to go. That That's where you're leveraging the advantages of FPGAs over fixed hardware. Even fixed hardware like, you know, the RP2040 with its PIO instruction set. Uh, Lois just replied, the number of LUTs used in my implementation is still more than it should be. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, there's plenty of room for optimization. I think we're still very heavy. Um, when they say the number of transistors they're using is similar in terms of size um, to the footprint of something like an SPI peripheral, we know we're already using too much. So there's a whole, you know, slew of optimization that could be performed on the PIO. If you want to dig deeper. Um, okay, for me, I think that wraps it up. So that's about, uh, we're on about the two and a half hour mark there or thereabouts. Uh, so it will probably do me for this evening. If you've got any questions, anyone, just post them now before I finish off. Um, but the PIO stuff has been an interesting journey, definitely. Um, might do something slightly different next week, I think. Let's see how we got on. Um, there's a bunch of things that we can talk about as well at a higher level. One of the other things I haven't mentioned that I've started doing some work on is uh, several streams back, we were looking at the Alloy platform idea. 
So from a point of view of a low powered um, robotics board, one of the things I've been looking at as an option is rather than just using the ESP32 uh, S2, um, which is confined to using Wi-Fi, um, is using something that supports Bluetooth because power wise it's much more efficient also supporting the wi-fi is really difficult because then you have to have all your libraries for supporting the communication over wi-fi whereas maybe going the bluetooth route is much simpler because it's just a serial console with some error checking and stuff as well so i've also been uh I purchased a few bits and bobs to start playing around with. This is one of them. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the NRF 52 series. There's quite a few. There's the 52, 10, 20, 30, and 40. And there's, a, there's also an 05 as well, which is really interesting. But that's. But this is kind of, of, of those selection, this one is the one with the most stuff in it. Um, and this does some nice stuff like for example unlike the other ones it has um it has um a quad spi interface now these are based around an stm32 m4 it's very very frugal on the power even when you're operating the bluetooth which is kind of cool so i want to have a look at using that along with the fpga as well for the li project because uh, I really want to get a board that does wireless along with the FPGA. So that might be uh, a good way to go. And unfortunately, S3 doesn't do Bluetooth. I mean, the ESP32, um, the original one, does do Bluetooth and wire, Wi-Fi. Uh, but it doesn't have a USB. Um, there is a C3, which is the RISC V based one, but the, the support is very um, early for that. Um, and I think that has Bluetooth and Wi Fi. And there's going to be an S3, I think, which also might support Bluetooth as well. But again, it still uses more power than those NRF ones. And the NRF might be an interesting way to go. I'm going to have a play around anyhow. So if I get that up and running at some point, don't expect it uh, next week because I won't be in a position to do that next week. But in a few weeks' time, we'll maybe dig into doing some of that. Uh, and the other side where this might be useful is for when people want a low-powered FPGA for doing IoT stuff as well. So that might be a useful combination or choice. And it would be better for battery life, etc. Uh, so for the moment, I'd probably pair that up with the ICE40 up 5K um just in the same way that we were with the esp32s um i believe we can also use micropython as well um i think this one has like loads of memory actually i think it's got like one meg of flash uh i can't remember how much ram quite a bit can't remember off the top of my head doesn't say on there i've also got a dinky little one as well which has got a USB connector built into the piece um, on the end of the um, board, which is kind of cool. But this one has a J-Link debugger on it as well, which is nice. So that's where I am, and I do want to move on to doing some of that. I'd love to do some robotic stuff. And on that front, before I forget, I was digging through my stuff um, because of something else. I had to go back and see if I can find one of my old discovery kits, which I didn't find, by the way. Uh, and I just ordered a new one for this particular thing. But uh, what I did find was a couple of things. So I found a big stepper driver from one of my old projects with two Toshes on it that can drive like four amp stepper motors if they wanted. That's proper stepper controllers. I don't really need that as much, but I thought I'd keep it out. We might find a use for that. And then um, 
more interestingly, remember I talked about those uh, 8540 chips that can drive up to three amps and we can use them for PWM or like full or half step larger motors. Well, this was a board I made for the Exmos uh, dev boards at the time. So I can take IOs and I've got um, some of those chips already installed in there. So assuming this still works, and I, I think it does, hoping I didn't blow it at some point, um, that will help us for driving some larger motors. Maybe we can, you know, drive something a bit bigger on the stepper front like that, you know, like a NEMA type size and also larger brushless. It would do small and large brushless as well. So a bit more news on that front. But I'm, I'm not going to cover all that now because um, we're out of time. But I, I do want to switch back to covering at least some of that, which will be interesting. And covering also things like PWM motors as well. Um, we could always revisit the PIO stuff as well, as Laurie's doing more on that. One of the things that Laurie was talking about maybe doing is integrating it with a kind of risk, soft risk vive, maybe based around uh, VEX or something, possibly, or um, Pico 32 RV, which is a Verilog uh, soft core based around 32 bit risk vive that uh, Claire designed um so let's call it a day then there's no more news come up in the chat um thank you all for joining me and hopefully either join me down at the forum uh from the links i provided or um down on discord again uh, the invite was on the url earlier just use that in the meantime um stay safe everyone and uh I look forward to um, participating with some more uh, FPGA hackery and stuff with you guys. Ciao.